Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namutasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namutasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Homage to him, the Holy One. I see, I always get mixed up on this. Homage to him, the Holy One, the Worshipped One, the Fully Enlightened One. I keep making it up. I don't know why I can't remember that. What is it, May? What Do you remember what it is? Uh, the, the Blessed One, the Worthy One. That's it. The blessed one, the holy one, the fully enlightened. The blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. I'm really sorry. It's just I don't know which pills I took this morning. This is really crazy. Okay. So I was looking over stuff and I have people calling me and doing all kinds of things at the same time as all this is going on. And um let's see. What I got into was I had two or three people write me this week about agitation and being upset and all of that. And I just thought that this would be fun to go into the condos and see what they said about it. And so what I want to do, if you have a Samyutta Nikaya, pull out the Samyutta Nikaya and go into page um, eight, let's see. I mean, it's 865, go to 865. And, you know, this, this section brings up some of the, some of the points. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned to you or not uh, that now this year we see some trickling out where monks would never be talking about certain things and they're talking about certain things more now. I guess that's the way to say it. They're saying it in open places. They're saying it. And one of the things we never talk about, uh, apparently, is we can talk about how many people come to Buddhism, but we can't talk about how many people leave Buddhism. We can't do that. And um, But lately, some remarks have been made in certain places that are very public. And um, these places are, a lot of people are watching these things and where we're doing talking and discussions and things like that and it's come up a couple times and i'm it's the first time in 20 years i've ever seen it come up in the open and it's something i've always said it's worth discussing <laughs> you know it's worth talking about about uh and when i was growing up i was in a number of different churches over the years uh i grew up in one and then a second one later with my mom and then probably two or three other ones in my own investigations in Christianity. And, but one of the things that was always there in Christianity, you may have heard me say this before, if there is a problem with a reverend or a minister who is preaching in a particular way is upsetting the congregation, it doesn't go on anymore because they have a board meeting. It's usually an open forum from letters from people in the congregation. And then it gets straightened out and he's requested to pay attention to certain things or else um, we get somebody else and he's asked to leave and they replace the minister, the pastor. This happens sometimes. And, but in Buddhism, this doesn't happen. And um, some of the things that, are, uh, that happen within Buddhism, if, if certain things are neglected or people are are changing in the culture is changing and advancing and people have needs as families, as people. And one of the things we spotted a long time ago uh, with tranquil wisdom insight meditation was people are really wanting very badly to have something they can take home from church, so to speak, or take home from the temple and they can use it all the time. And that's why we, I get very excited about Twim. I get very excited about uh, about the six R's because this is something that is right effort going into action and going back for those of you who haven't been here before 
um, the practice is basically uh, the foundation of it comes from right effort out of the eightfold path. And it's that piece shows up in many places in the text and is explained as right effort or right striving with four steps involved. And it has to do, of course, with the main theme in Buddhism of uh, looking inside of yourself to see what it is that triggers or what is that causes you to have suffering. And, and it uh, looks inside to see if you are, are living through this right effort or, or the actual interpretation has gotten lost over time, been lost in translation. In, in the way that we treat the definition for, for a right effort in the Eightfold Path. Now, if we had called it something else like um, harmonious practice, which is what, or right practice, and, and my teacher really didn't like right and wrong because there's enough of that in the world, <laughs> you know? And it's time to, to look at the uniqueness of humanity and say, if we're going to say that we're at the top of the chain of being able to think of things and new ideas and, and come up with innovation and try new things, we should really start doing that. <laughs> it's just about where we are, but we can't seem to do it because we're stuck with right and wrong and you're right and I'm wrong. That thing is going on. Instead of possibilities, we seem to we're really bright, you know, we used to have common sense, but a lot of that seems to have disappeared nowadays. Uh, but we supposedly, and on, on the chain of development, I'm reading an article right now about this. Um, we are supposedly sitting at the top, and yet we give up, uh, we close the door on new possible solutions. <laughs> because of mostly what's happened in the past. And when we say what's happened in the past is we're stuck on, it's definitely going to happen again. And if we're all sitting there with that kind of attitude, we can never go beyond where we are. And that seems to be where we're stuck. And young people have gone to the UN. One time I saw a 12 year old go in and address the UN. I thought it was fantastic because she was just right there, you know, addressing it. Like, who do you guys think you are? You have to get yourself in shape because your whole structure is sitting there for us, not for you. It's sitting there for us when we grow up and you're, you're preaching from a place where you are caught on the track. Your car is not moving anymore. It's like not going down uh, forward. You know, we're stuck with something. And um, I, I say sometimes there must be something in our DNA that, that just isn't going to permit us to do that. But at the same time, I think uh, I like to hold out the possibility and the hope that somebody can have an impact because it's, it's never going to straighten out. This is the falsehood. It will never straighten out by somebody deciding a new kind of control to make everybody do this. It doesn't work. It has to be an evolutionary thing of what did we have? The uh, harmonic conversion in the 1980s. And we had uh, the development of open consciousness that came in the 90s. And we're hoping, all of us are hoping that these things are really, really evolutionary things are actually happening in humanity. And then enough of them can happen so that we don't close the door anymore. And we go out on the edge and say, well, if not me, then who? And if not now, when? And that's what the young people are starting to say, the young people who are coming up. Long story short, wow. <laughs> okay. Long story short, we want to look inside ourselves. And the Buddha comes along and he says, we're not going to look out at an object and think that an object in any meditation is ever going to solve the problem of the, uh, the problem that is caused when we become obsessed and frightened and distressed and anxious and we're clinging to something and the clinging is what tricks, trickle, you know, tricks off, turns on, off, I'm sorry, turns on the problem of suffering. So when we're in, we're, I'm, we're looking, playing in the Kanda Samyutta. So the Kanda is, the Kandas are the aggregates. And so the human being is, uh, constructed of this body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness is to operate. This is from your head to your toe is the body uh, and the feeling 
you think of three kinds of feeling. Uh, perception is naming things. The thoughts arise in the operation of the human being. And when those thoughts come up, then immediately you, you uh, perceive it as I, I, I like this or I don't like it. This is where the craving hits. And then we have this thing called clinging the upadana. And when we get to upadana, this is the problem. So when you see when you see some of the things that are happening today that are uh, I was always looking out, by the way, always keep your eye out for why would anybody ever call Buddhism pessimistic? And I always am looking for that. And so if you see somebody who writes about the five aggregates affected by clinging, they don't say affected by clinging. If they say the five aggregates are the cause of suffering, that's wrong. That's wrong. It has to be when they're affected by clinging or if affected by clinging or affected by clinging. And so if that's not there, there's something wrong with the translation. And you have to go back and figure out from you what you know about dependent origination, what is causing the real problem, you see? What is causing the suffering? Is it enough to say that craving uh, is causing the suffering or is there another piece? And we know there's another piece. And that piece has to do with atta and anatta. You see that craving isn't significant unless atta is there to push it through. I has to enter into this. I like, I want, I get stuck with attachment. And this attachment is the mental proliferation of why I like or I don't like, why I want or I don't want. So you have attachment, you have aversion. And these things both have tension, have tightness, cause the headaches, everything. Now, does that sound like something else that we talk about all the time? Yeah, talk about uh, hindrances, don't we? And so as soon as we say we're stuck with I want, I don't want, I'm, I'm moving towards attachment or I'm pushing with aversion. It's an interesting thing. I, I was meditating once and I kept having this thing come up. How much tension is there to grab something and try to hold on to it? And how much uh, is there that has to do with wanting to push it away? And it's probably an equal amount of tension and tightness. And yet what we're trying to do all the time in this practice is moved down a path that is literally a path of cessation, less and less and less of what? Less of me and mine and who I am and looking at everything in a different perspective, a different way of looking at it, practicing it all the time. Whenever you run into a situation out there on the street, um, in any interaction with anybody for any reason, whether it's a car accident or a bump or you parked crooked or something, or you went in the store and you, someone thought you cut in line and you didn't and somebody's upset, it doesn't matter what it is. If you pause for just a moment and say, I have two ways of looking at this whole situation, of watching this person, the other person in a compassionate way and letting, seeing what's going to happen, you know? in a compassionate way and giving them space in that compassion. And then it's with loving kindness, go through step-by-step step what actually happened, what was the cause of it? What's the situation? Can we let it go? Can we forgive each other? Yeah, sure you can. And make that happen and start smiling in the situation and accepting instead of rejecting. But really what you're doing is you're saying, I can handle this personally, or I can handle it, you know, impersonally. And so what you're doing is looking, what is essentially happening here? And what am I doing? If I take it personally, you're definitely looking down behind you and saying, you know, this is just like when such and such happened before. And that is what is causing my suffering. And so let go, relax, smile, come back.
think of a way to get cookies and ice cream <laughs> and go have tea, literally, you know, let, let it go. And it's a funny thing about this Atta thing being the key to this whole thing, because somebody said to me, but he doesn't say it's the key. I said, do you really think that he was going to give you absolutely everything? He does give it to us. You have to know where it is. And it is in certain places where we run into it all over the texts. Okay. But did you really think he was going to tell you everything? Uh -uh. Because he's teaching you how to investigate. And he really wanted you to investigate and follow you. His steps of investigation exactly the way he did it. So you could experience this remarkable discovery of it's not me. It's not mine. It's not myself. Oh my gosh, it's not my fault. Oh my dear, it's not happening to me. It's happening from my decision of how I'm going to go and see it. That's what's happening here. And he wanted you to have that discovery for yourself. Yeah. So it's interesting to watch what happens when he starts talking about agitation. It's on page 865 in the Samyutta Nikaya. And it says, at su this is, uh, it's sutta number seven, and then seven in parentheses, agitation through clinging, and then parentheses one. So on page 865, at Sawati, he says, monks, I will teach you agitation through clinging and non-agitation through non-clinging. Listen to that and attend closely and I will speak. Yes, venerable sir, the monks replied, and the blessed one said this. And how, bhikkhus, how is there agitation through clinging? Here, monks, the uninstructed worldling, who is not a seer of the noble ones, he is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, who is not a seer of superior persons, and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma. That means he forgot to come to a retreat with one of us and have some fun. <laughs> okay. Um, regards form as self or self as possessing form or form as in self or self as in form. These are all the different ways that you can look at this as being me and it's mine and myself. That form of his changes and alters. And with the change and alteration of the form, his consciousness becomes preoccupied with the change of the form. Now, remember, this only happens for a person that has not spent some time with who? <laughs> Anicca <laughs> has not spent time learning deeply how impermanence works. And so they get upset. Agitation and a constellation of mental states. It means a certain constellation affecting all the different mental states you can have is born of preoccupation uh, with the change of form, which remains obsessing his mind keeps obsessing him. Now, if you go to the note on this, if the notes are usually at the end of each one of the sections, and this is, that's where they are here. And if we go to find them, let's see, I did this a little while ago. Um, and you look at the note for this. Whoops, I do that the wrong way. I thought I should have marked this for you, but I didn't. Let's see if I can do it again. Here we go. Um, so we're in around page, go to 1050 and you'll see 32. And he's talking about craving in a constellation of unwholesome states. The long compound word uh, means, in, it's a big long word in, in um, Pali. And he's saying the long compound word might also have been construed as a constellation of states uh, arisen from or associated with agitation because first you get uptight and stressed and then the agitation, you start to move and then it falls into 
different states from there. And um, then it's talking about the sense of craving. It seems to me that the text emphasizes agitation through fear. So these are the different things that come up with emotion of fear and such as that. But when he's talking about it here, he's saying because his mind is obsessed, then he becomes frightened. Now you see how the line goes. His, he becomes obsessed. Then he becomes frightened, distressed, anxious. And through clinging, he becomes agitated where he starts to move and do actions physically with the body and very agitated, very tight in the mind, okay? Now you see how these compound on each other. Like there's the, you could say the cause of being frightened is to be obsessed with this that came into the mind and the cause or the condition that arises for frightened is obsessed and for distressed is frightened and for, um, for uh, anxiousness is your distress and then you get anxious, anxious, anxious. And then through clinging, he becomes agitated. So you see how it's a causal line, see that? Okay, and it's, a, it's with a set of conditions that rolls over into the next one. He paid a lot of attention to this after he figured out before he was awakened, he figured out the um, preconditions for each one of the links to arise in dependent origination. He suspected it. So when he was watching and investigating and discovering things like this about agitation, he would also look and see the causal line or the condition that comes species like that. And he regards feeling as self and looks at that personally. So he sees feeling as self and, so, and, um, and self as in feeling and um, in regards um, feeling uh, as self and self-possessing uh, feeling. And you take the, the um, sentence up above and put it in each one of the ditto marks. And when you read it, you have to put up mark it. I usually use different color pens, you know, <laughs> to do it. And then perception as self, you look at, he looks at perception as self. And then he sees self as perception and he sees self as possessing uh, perception and perception as in self and self as in perception. So he keeps rolling over this examination and seeing it again. And then he sees the same thing in volitional formations. And remember volitional formations means action of will. At volition has to do with the determination of your will, the, the energy that is in there for the will for something to happen is what it's about. And then consciousness, he does the whole thing with consciousness. We call this the idiot's game when we try to read this with the self each time. You know, it's like consciousness as self and then self as consciousness and um, self-possessing consciousness and consciousness in self and he goes through the whole thing again and or self as possessing consciousness or consciousness as in self or self as in consciousness the consciousness of his changes and it alters with the change or the alteration of consciousness his consciousness becomes preoccupied with the change in consciousness itself you see so this is what's happening to him. He's, he's getting all wrapped up in this little pieces as it comes in, but it's all coming back to what? It's coming back to Atta, the self each time. An agitation and a constellation of mental states born of the preoccupation with the change of the consciousness, they remain obsessing his mind when this is going on. Because his mind is obsessed, that is why he becomes frightened, distressed, and anxious through clinging, holding on to mental proliferation is what this is. The same as we talk about when we're talking about MN18 and we're looking at the um, Matu Pandika Sutta, the Honeyball Sutta, okay? Clinging, he becomes agitated. So in such a way, monks, uh, that there is agitation through clinging. 
And how much is there non-agitation? So now he always does this. He talks about the, um, the negative or the unwholesome situation. And then he goes and he clears it up by giving you the answer right after that. So actually, we need a concordia to be built for these books. You know, the concordance we use with the Bible has all these little conditions. And you look up the topics you know, love, hate, agitation, fear, obsession, all that. And then it shows you where it is in the various pieces in the Bible. That's what we need. We need a concordance for this, uh, for the Samyutinikai. I don't think there is one, but it could be a nice work for somebody to do. Only five years or so. <laughs> okay. And monks, is there non-agitation? How is there non-agitation through non-clinging? Well, here, monks, the instructed noble disciple who is the seer of the noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, um, who is a seer of superior persons and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, he does not regard form as self or self as possessing form or form as in self or self as in form. Now, see, this where it sounds to me always like it's a drill. It's a drill. It's a practice drill for you to take out and to use it all day long at work. And you can take one thing if you want to and just look at that all day using form as the example. Or you can use um, feeling as example for the whole day. And you start examining these things and going a little bit deeper. And you, you're staying on track and you're doing this with the mind one layer deeper, one layer deeper, one layer deeper. And what this does is this is how you're retraining your mind to consider the all day perspective for you to carry through the day of not taking things personally, but stopping a moment and looking to see exactly what is happening in any given situation before you act and take action with it. And this is how you, you perfect that. And then he says that form of his changes and alters, despite the change in the alteration of the form, his consciousness does not become preoccupied with the change of the form. And so no agitation and constellation of mental states born of preoccupation with the change of form remain obsessing his mind. And because his mind is not obsessed, we took away the condition, he is not frightened and he's not distressed and he's not anxious. And through not clinging, he does not become agitated. So if you stop when you really get angry, get upset at something, you realize you're pounding it by taking it personally, you see? And so we're really, what, what, is this, what does this whole thing tell you? I'm not helpless. <laughs> I'm not stuck. I'm actually powerful and I actually have hope. And it's okay for me to have hope that I can change because this is systematically explaining to you what precisely is wrong and how to turn it around by practicing letting it go and shifting from taking it personally to impersonally. And the best way to, you know, handle this during the week at work is to pretend you're putting a white lab coat on as you arrive at the office. <laughs> and you're a researcher and you're going in and you're just going to sit down and watch what's happening and see if you can actually see what is truly happening or whether you're stuck not understanding yet. Just consider the idea when you go in, probably I'm going to take everything personally. And then look at it and see at the end of the day, write out what happened. You know, you go home, you sit down, you have some juice or something, you sit there and you just write down what happened in any particular incident. If there was a, a something difficult that happened with somebody, you write it down and then you turn the page, you write it down again. But when you write it down again, you write out 
what would have happened if you had remained impersonal and don't give me this thing. Yeah, but the other person, it's none of your business what the other person did. It only has to be one of you who decides that you're going to help yourself to look through this looking glass impersonally for today. That's what Alice in Wonderland was really all about, you know, <laughs> it's part of what it was going on. Um, okay. He does not regard feeling as self. He does this with that. He does it with perception. He does it with volitional formations. He does it with consciousness. And when you sit there and read these quietly through and write them out with the whole sentence there with it, you get consciousness as self or self as possessing consciousness or consciousness as in self or self as in consciousness is it really there and you know it's not there that consciousness of his changes and it alters it does naturally shift inside all of this practice is doing is taking you back to a natural state that's all it's doing taking you back to a natural state and despite the change and alteration of the consciousness, his consciousness does not become preoccupied with the change of the consciousness. You don't do that. You just leave everything impersonally and become a watcher in life. We're teaching you to be a watcher, an observationist that is in the practice, watching how everything works. No agitation and constellation of mental states born of preoccupation with the change of consciousness will remain obsessing his mind anymore. Because his mind is not obsessed, he is not frightened, he doesn't get distressed and anxious. And through non clinging, without the clinging, he does not become agitated. Okay. It is in such a way, monks, that there is non-agitation through non-clinging. So then he, that's what he says. He explains it that way. Now, there's another one here that talks about um, agitation through, um, well, let's keep going. Let's do this one too. This is eight. Number eight, and then eight in parentheses and parentheses two, agitation through clinging. It's on 866, page 866. Now, monks, I will teach you agitation through clinging and non agitation through non clinging. Listen to this and attend closely. So, we taught this one in a different place. Okay. Well, this is in Sawati too, right? Both of these were in Sawati, I guess, right? Yeah, both of them probably there for the rains retreat or something okay um listen to listen to this and attend closely and the monks uh and how monks is their agitation through clinging monks the uninstructed worldling he regards form thus this is mine this i am this is myself and that form of his changes and alters with the change in the alteration of form, there arises his sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And he regards feeling thus. Let's see. This is mine. This I am, this is myself. And that feeling of his changes and alters, and with the change and the alteration of the feeling, there arises in him sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair. Perception, he sees perception thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. And that form of his changes and it alters. And with the change and the alteration of the perception, there arises in him sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair. Volitional formations. 
he sees those thus this is mine this i am this is myself and the form i'm sorry the um consciousness what did we say volitional formations i'm sorry uh the volitional formations of his changes and alters and then with the change and the alteration of the volitional formations there arise in him sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair and consciousness is looked upon thus this consciousness is mine this i am and this is myself and that consciousness his changes and alters and with the change and alteration of the consciousness there arises in him sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair okay so that's how he's working through this is mine this i am this is myself and the consciousness of his changes and each one changes in the same way and with the change and alteration of each one there arises in him sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair in such a way this is how agitation happens through clinging and how do you suppose this non-agitation through non-clinging occurs here monks the instructed noble disciple does not regard form thus this is mine this i am this is not that form of his changes and alters and with the change and alteration of the form there do not arise in him sorrow lamentation pain displeasure and despair he does not regard feeling this way or perception volition formations or consciousness thus this is mine this i am this is myself the consciousness of his changes and alters but with the change and alteration of the consciousness they there does not arise in him any sorrow lamentation pain grief or despair and that it is in such a way monks that there is a non-agitation through non-clinging and this changes gradually within the person this is not something that we just expect it's just going to um happen we have to practice it noticing this is happening in your meditation but also practicing it in planned daily type drills during living time when you're taking this into life and start to look beyond the retreat setup into life it has to go into life it has to be useful in life and be seen totally and completely clearly okay so how do you think we should test it and where did we see this before we saw it in 148 we saw it in 137. We saw it in several different places, all over the place. We see it in Satipatthana Sutta. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. Is basically a training in looking at the powerful position we're actually in, where we can decide to change our perspective. Nobody else can change our perspective. This is where we come down to the personal responsibility in Buddhism that uh it, you are actually running the show <laughs> you know it's it's like you're going through life you're actually steering the boat you are but the whole issue is understanding how things work relieves all the things that can come up in your mind that give you a problem about something if you just know how everything works I remember the first year, it's a long time back, but the first year I rode was cycling in round Washington, DC. I did it for about two, two and a half years, I think, before I left. And um, it wasn't long enough, but we moved to Missouri. We couldn't be done. So that was the end of it. Um, not because there was a rule against it, just because a lot of sort of uh, people, a lot of people like driving their trucks and kind of pushing you in the gutter. <laughs> so we don't do it on farm roads. It just doesn't work out. 
But I remember going to the bike shop and asking him, you know, he said, did you, how much did you ride this year? Because I was always going over there for stuff. And I said, I figured it out. It was 2,300 miles. Is that pretty good? <laughs> he just went, it was. That's a decent year. It's a very decent year. That was my first year cycling. And it wasn't hard to come by because these, these uh, you know, the was riding four or five times a week. And these rides that we were doing, 37 miles, 46 miles, um, let me see, 72 miles to Mount Vernon. And then, um, yeah, 72 miles to Mount Vernon. And then, uh, and back, this is going down and back. And then we, there's an 81, an 80 mile one that we did during the week. And then by the weekend, we, we topped it off with a 125 mile ride. So it wasn't hard to, to do this, you know, over the period of a year, it just all built up. So see, it isn't hard for you to just go to work one day, <laughs> one day and, and just practice the basics of what he's talking about, because that's all this is, is repetition does what? Repetition trains your mind. That's how we train the neural pathways in our brain to respond. And we're taking a, a step in the direction of retraining ourselves to not take things so seriously and just abruptly decide to attack our neighbors. Boom, like that. We don't need to be doing that. Yeah, we don't need to. Innovation and everything comes about when you feel secure. It doesn't come about when you're all working in an office where you're all distressed and unhappy. The bottom profit line for those who are only interested in money should be observed as something that grows when people are doing what they love and love what they're doing and they produce more in an office setting. And the flexibility of that in management needs to come back. It's not there as much as it was before. Um, I know when I was younger, the stockholder didn't run the company. The stockholders had the opportunity to own stock in a company that was run by the people who owned the company and ran it. And then over time, now it seems like stockholders try to run the company for what reason? Many of them have never even gone in the door. They don't know what's manufactured there and they certainly haven't met the people or have anything to do with it, but they want more money. And that's not good for business, but you could have even more money than they could dream of if people were happy where they're working, making enough money to be well taken care of in their lives, which would produce the whole thing would go upwards in profitability. So even in the time of the Buddha, the merchants loved the Buddha. Many stories about the merchants being the people who helped him and became the followers for the Buddha. And not the Pindaka, he's one of them. Okay, with merchant class, you see. So why? Well, because everything became more profitable. He kind of went overboard, but... <laughs> He, he became bankrupt and then he had to climb out of that before he died and he had to build it all up again. But it's okay. I mean, he was in love with what he was doing for the Buddha and he served everything and because he took care of the Dhamma so well, he got it, he got it all back. But he learned a fantastic life, what he did at that time with the Buddha. Absolutely fantastic life. We have a couple of people that help us around here seem like the jovial, happy-go-lucky Anathem Pindika, Anathem Pindika rather, he's, he's still around. You know, he can help people. That happens in temples sometimes. I've been at temples where there isn't one or two like that. But when there's one there, they're happy. They are so joyful at what they're doing and how they're helping. It's wonderful to see this, see them take care of people. So what do you think about the core structure of suffering. I'm going to turn it over to you now and tell me, what do you think about it? You know, do you think it's just craving or is it go back to the Atta? You know, can it be just craving without these things involved? What do you think?
Yeah. Uh, well, it seems to me that Atta is absolutely central um, to, to this because Atta is, uh, we, we talk about craving, giving the f uh, fueling things, but actually Atta is what puts the fuel on the fire. Um, and uh, Atta, is, uh, Atta is where all the energy comes from because that's where the investment is. Um, uh, in that identity or in, in what it represents or the, or the sense of losing, losing something. Um, so I, I was very interested in the, in the sutta that you chose because it's, it, I think it's quite informative be, simply because of that one paragraph which, which links the preoccupation, um, which starts the obsession, which then causes uh, being frightened and distressed and then anxious and then the agitation. I like and so that. All, all, all the investment is then in in uh, how do I how do I manage all of this this constellation as it was described um, and and trying to manage this takes so much energy so much effort um, uh, so cutting it off at the source uh, but the source is the taking it personally it's the utter. Um, it, it seems to me it's not the, the craving, it's the, it's the step back, it's the utter itself. It's, the, it's that identity, um, which, is, which is so, um, so critical. Um, and I was also very interested in what you said very at the first part about the importance of recognizing that everything isn't suffering, but that it's this, this introduction of the sense of I that creates the sense of suffering. Um, and, and I'd be interested if we've got time to look at uh, a couple of suttas on, which is number 10, because I think this is where some of the misunderstanding comes, because I think sometimes things are, are described in a much briefer uh, presentation. Um, yeah, I, I will do that one. We'll do that one because I noticed that, too. And yeah. um, one of the things that bothers me with buddhism when i started talking about nobody's talking about why people are leaving because well one of the reasons people are leaving is because um we don't look carefully enough and use the text themselves to get into explaining things and when people just come in from anywhere and just say well i'm prepared to teach i remember that i may have told you all the story i was at a thai temple in chicago and a guy was um, teaching in the new Dhamma hall they were building. And the abbot wanted to let him do this, but the guy was so nonchalant about everything. And by that, I mean, you know, he said, I want to, he told me there was a real problem, but he asked me, would I ask Bonte if he would talk to him? And Bonte said, why don't I go talk to him? <laughs> you know, so I sat down, I sat down with him and I said, you know, the, the abbot wants to help you with your group that you have coming in here, sitting on the floor and, front of the Buddha and um, teaching uh, each week, you know, he would like to offer you a monk to help you uh, learn how to do this better. And he says, I know exactly what I'm doing. And I said, oh, I, I'm sorry. Did you train somewhere? No, 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 no. I, I went to Thailand for two weeks and I came back. I'm completely trained. And I, <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. I don't know. And he was being kind of nonchalant about it. And I said, well, you know, the thing is, I didn't teach for nine years. I, I, I was <laughs> studying and learning and trying to understand everything. Somebody being that nonchalant about this is just a very surface thing. Buddhism isn't really complicated at all. Let's just teach it. I've been on a trip to Thailand. I'm back. I'm going to teach. That was all there was. Throw money in the hat in the middle of the circle and and. Uh, it's your turn to read a poem this week and just sit in a circle and be quiet and be calm for an hour. And that's the meeting. That's all there was. And the abbot really wanted to help him because he knew he wanted to teach, but it was like sort of like up to the abbot. And I felt bad about it. I didn't quite know what to do except to tell him, you know, he said, don't worry about it. We're moving out of here. We found a place down the street to do this anyway. So don't let him worry about it. So we kind of dropped it. But you see, this is the kind of thing that's going on right now. And, and Buddhism, if it isn't careful, it begins to look like 
the Brahmin tradition of the songs and the prayers and everything, the way it talks about it in the Chanki Sutta, how everything is, you know, the person is this and they have this and this and this and this and they know the prayers and the prayers and this and this and this. And they only do that for seven generations back. We've repeated these and why do we want to go talk to Gautama Buddha? And then Chunk, he explains why um, he should go there and, and he should uh, visit him and pay respect because he's, he's, in, he's insinuating he's really found something valuable and we should all go and listen to it. It's more than what was there. That's what that part of what that sutta is about. There's more that he found beyond what we just repeat all the time. You see, and that's when you have somebody who's teaching like the guy who went to visit Thailand for two weeks and comes back and decides to put a hat on and say, I'm going to teach Buddhism and get people. And he had like 12, 15 people doing this with him. That's the one that will decide to come in and read something like 10 is such a tiny little thing. And if he can't explain it beyond what it says. So you listen to it carefully. At Sawati. It's called suffering in the three times. In monks, form is suffering both of the past and the future, not to speak of the present. Seeing thus monks, the instructed noble disciple is indifferent towards form in the past and he does not seek delight in form in the future and he does is practicing for the revulsion towards form in the present and for its fading away and cessation. Now, it goes through each one of the aggregates in the same treatment as this little tiny paragraph. So what's wrong with this? What is wrong with this? Well, if you don't, you know, have the Bada Karata Sutta first, <laughs> You know, you should actually, if you're, you were teaching somebody just this, this could be a little distressing, okay? Because first of all, the word revulsion always gets me a little upset. And I haven't had this discussion, but I keep saying, I want to go and call, talk to, to Bhikkhu Bodhi about this because I need to understand this better. Or one of the poly instructors at the university needs to really talk to me about this because the word revulsion is strong, isn't it? It's a strong yeah. word, isn't it? And so this is where if you don't explain this and have the person doesn't have enough foundation, you were to take this and teach it, they would be the one that would come out frowning all the time and thinking, I have to have a strong revulsion towards smelling the rose or a revulsion towards seeing, looking up and seeing the beautiful clouds like behind May in her picture behind her, you know, the beautiful clouds in the sky. Don't look up, don't see those. You should be repulsed by that, you see, by seeing that. <laughs> and everything in life should be suffering. Takes us this, it, just bare bones teaching it like this, takes us so far away from the fact that Life, in life, pain is inevitable for everyone to experience, but suffering is optional. And that's what the Buddha found out. And this takes you completely to another path if you only get to hear this one thing. This is why we say to people, basically stay away from the Samyutta Nikaya or the, um, you know, go playing with the Anguttara Nikaya or the Samyutta Nikaya until you really know the, the good, strong foundation that's given to you with the whole teaching explained enough in the Majjhima Nikaya. That's my position on all of this. I can't go away from that. I want to keep that position. And it's very difficult now because, you know, we we put, we have people, you know, involved with TWIM now who want to push the Samyutta out there without even talking about the Majjhima Nikaya at all sometimes. And we have to be careful of that, very careful, because it's the things like this that are sitting in this book.
And that's, that's the position on this whole thing. So you have to understand that when you take feeling like that, uh, this is, I tell you, you, you never going to have monks walking around smiling. <laughs> they just took this one and harped on it for a whole week, unless somebody really explained it to them, you see? And so the fear, you have a lot of people coming out of, in, in, that are in Buddhism right now. Even my uncle, even my uncle before he died said to me, I don't know though, you're so happy. How can you be a Buddhist nun? Now, I don't know who he had met as a Buddhist nun before. And I do know I'm different. I do know that. I'm too happy. <laughs> but that's such a funny thing to say because we are the happy ones. So how does that work? We are the happy ones. We are supposed to have joy. And now, let me tell you something. Oh, where was I reading that? Oh, yeah, I was... I was ready, getting, yesterday I was getting hyped up about this. I went into the, the argument, I'll tell you what happened. Um, they invited me to go to a wedding and it was the father of the bride who invited me to go to the wedding. So I, of course I said, I'll come. I hadn't been to one in a while and I've been to about seven of them since I've been here. Now, the other six, I wanna point out, were in one of the big banquet halls and um, the professional person was there to marry the couple. Hmm? You understand? Now, if you go into the, I checked immediately after this happened, if you look and ask the question in your computer, you can just do it up there in the line. <clears throat> um, are Buddhist monks allowed to perform marriage ceremonies? Go ahead and do it, punch it in. It will tell you that um, Buddhist monks do not marry people. They go to marriages to do blessings after the marriage ceremony is over. This is what it says. Now, I love these things like Wikipedia and stuff like that. You don't know who put that in there and anything. And that is correct. That is correct, by the way. That one is correct. But what I, I did uh, this morning, I flipped over to see something about the precepts. Boy, they did a whopper job on that. You know, you don't know who's putting this stuff up and I, nobody's monitoring it. I mean, you could just destroy a religion at this point. <laughs> you could just go in there and start rewriting stuff and just blow it away, really. And it's so inaccurate when it starts talking about um, the third uh, precept about sexual conduct, it just blows it away. Like it's not important at all. You know, it doesn't even get to the part about you don't want to cause pain and suffering for the two people involved, or it skips all the stuff, the stuff about don't, don't fool around with somebody else's mate or some Somebody else's wife or husband, adultery, don't commit adultery, doesn't really go there anymore. Okay. And it doesn't say anything about somebody too young that's living with their parents. It doesn't tell you that part. It was obviously somebody who wrote it who fell for the new version of it. For instance, when you say the, the next one is don't lie, don't tell lies. And that's it. Nothing else. Nothing else. Doesn't tell you about gossiping, doesn't say anything about slander, doesn't explain harsh language. It just says, don't lie. And that's it. I actually had a guy call me from Canada once. Why are you teaching all this stuff about that precept? All it is is don't lie. I said, no, no, you don't understand. There are suttas in there that explain the whole precept. You just have to know where they are. But we left these priests. We left the suttas behind. Now, I don't know. I didn't go to the section on the Visuddhi Maga on this one. I didn't check yet. I don't know if I can point there and say that's where this started. But the point is, if I've had several situations, and, th and this article is about how this is all working in the Buddhist precepts and everything. It's okay for people to live with each other before they're married. I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that one. 
Um, okay. Then um, there were several things in there that just were, uh, where did this come from? It's just somebody who decided to do a new version that was more comfortable so they could be Buddhist. <laughs> that was what seemed to me. And, um, but we, we should be able to smile if we're Buddhist. If we can't smell, and I remember my, uh, anyway, okay, so I back up, I went to the wedding and I'm sitting there and the three monks were there, they didn't expect me. <laughs> and uh, the, I put a space between them and me and sat, I put an extra chair space between because they don't know you're supposed to do that. So I did, you know, and then I'm sitting there and the monk gets up and I said, what's he doing? The third monk. <laughs> Oh, well, he's going to marry them and do the ring ceremony. I said, what? I had no idea. I was going to a wedding where the monks were going to marry the people. I was totally shocked. And I couldn't get to the bottom of it because there wasn't enough communication between them and me, you know, with language. But I kept asking this one to ask that one to ask him, why is he doing this? And then um, I said, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, this is not a good idea for you to do this. I kept saying, you know, actually, you're, you're hurting the whole system. And then afterwards, he said, well, it was the problem. I said, you don't marry people. We don't marry people. We bless them after the ceremony. And he said, well, they came to us and asked us to marry him. What are we supposed to do? I said, you're the monk. You're supposed to explain this to them and teach them. This was an opportunity to teach them. Monks do not marry people in the Buddhist religion, you know, our setup. It doesn't happen. Now, here we go. The Zen, uh, the Zen monks can do that. But that's been there forever. I'll just say that's been there forever. But a Theravada monk marrying somebody? I was shook up with no place to go, no one to talk to, no disciplinary system at all. So if they decided to do this, that means they're all gonna start doing it because this was one for like 4,000 people. And I said, now 4,000 people believe that monks are gonna marry people. So, you know, hmm? there you go. That's how the dilution of the Dhamma takes place. And I am not going to not talk about this anymore because that was really a shock for me. I didn't know if I could get up and leave because I knew the family and I didn't want to do that. And I didn't want to get in myself in a position. Yeah. Hmm? yeah. Hmm? They speak only emptiness, including Zen, Mahayana. They don't know anything about the dependent organization. Well, they even... Even the Actually, books do not speak about the dependent ordination. This is I know the that. I know that, Sarma. I, I know that. They don't speak. The drawback of the system. Well, most the of them are lay people. Well, <laughs> the, the Zen people, it's closer to lay people. I, Zen people, my experience with Zen was six months in a Zen center with, with the abbot, and the people came on weekends that were the other people and they were the lay people who are for the weekend part of this you know like like the the cantors in the catholic church or the people that carry the crosses and things like that you know for the sunday service so zen is set up a different way you know a, but theravada this is not something that should be happening in theravada and it's just gonna it's just gonna roll now roll through if it isn't already but i went I can't think, stop and think. I was to four different weddings in, in Rangabad. This was not happening. And the people who are the professionals and then that do the marriage part. I went to a big uh, political representative's family and the, ch the children got married. And uh, the professional person to marry people was there. And in some countries you go, you know, to the, I think in China they do this and in Russia, they do it in a lot of countries, they do it, where you go to the town hall and you get married there, then you have a service or a reception. And that's what I was used to. Uh, with Bonte, we went to several weddings where we, we, we would go and watch the service by someone else. And then we would do the blessing and a talk on the Eightfold Path, you see? But there was no talk. There was just this 
little service. And because the monk really didn't know what quite to do, there wasn't much of vows or anything like that. It was just a ring ceremony. And that was it. I pronounced, and they tied their hands together for a split second, but didn't tell them why and didn't tell anybody why. And these weddings are real interesting because there's five, it's, it, you know, it's really fascinating what, what the digital world does to personal experiences. Here's four, three or 4,000 people sitting in front of you, and they have these little things flying around, taking pictures of everybody there and the wedding, and the little things are flying up here, taking pictures of the people getting married here. And there's 11 photographers between the people getting married and the audience, and the audience can see nothing except they see it on a big TV screen out here. And <laughs> it's just like, it's so impersonal. Then afterwards, there is a nice thing that happens afterwards. They have to walk through the whole audience and say hello to everybody. Think about that for a minute, how many people I just said were there. And they have to go and talk to these people row by row through the whole thing. It's kind of like Agony City, you know, to get married and, and um, walk through the whole audience and say hello to everybody. But um, there's nothing, almost nothing private about getting married on the stage because you have all these photographers around you. Very strange, Dis disconnected. But um, what we're saying about this sutta in number 10 is that it's so simple here, but can be misunderstood so easily. So the second part, goes to feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness, pointing to the past, both from incidents in the past and the future, not to speak of the present time right here, and seeing thus the instructed noble disciple is indifferent towards consciousness of the past. Well, that's healthy. Let's see, who was he? He was the... Um, he instructed, the instructed disciple has decided to be indifferent about the past, and he, he does not seek delight in consciousness of the future. He's not worried about the future. But unless you can explain this because you were with Vadakarata first, you know, and you did that part about the past and future and present time lesson, you don't really know what this means. And he's practicing for the revulsion towards consciousness of the present. Now, why do we need to practice to be repulsed by something? Do you see what I'm saying? That's where this word revulsion, I've looked it up in the source of it and everybody, it, it comes from repulsion, you know, repulsing it. Why do we have to repulse it rather than rest in the equanimity of understanding how it works and simply be here now to experience it, understanding that a Nietzsche takes care of everything and it will pass. Do you understand? But if I don't explain that to you, you have to go into life thinking I must be repulsed from everything, you know, have revulsion for eating my food, have revulsion for uh, everything. That, that is not what Buddhism was teaching. It's not. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I think, I haven't checked the Pali for, for this verse, but I think the revulsion here is what Bhikkhu Bodhi in other circumstances translates as dispassion. Um, and um, well, disenchantment would be no, enough. disenchantment. Yeah, dis <laughs> yeah, disenchantment. I think is what. See, he what has I'm disenchantment not. and then dispassion. Two different That's levels right. there. Okay. Yeah, and I think the revulsion <laughs> is what he usually, what he has in other circumstances called disenchantment. And you see, disenchantment for me uh, isn't about putting energy in; it's about taking energy out of something. Whereas revulsion has a sense of putting energy in mm -hmm. and I think this I, I, I if we work on the idea of cooling then we want to take energy out of situations we want to but you know that's right so, that's right so the, dis so the disenchantment I think is a better translation than, yeah. than revulsion and see it's it's out of um it falls out of balance okay uh because what you are 
trying to see what is essential and what is unessential, just seeing what is essentially happening and going from where it starts until it finishes or starts and finishes, okay? <laughs> and um, understanding and Nietzsche takes hold and whatever is happening will be not be there, it arises, it is there, it exists and it passes away. See now where I took that from just then was basically taking you from uh, the Anupada Sutta of seeing how things operate. And he keeps repeating it in the verses of Anupada Sutta number 111. It was not there. It arose, it was there, and it passed away. He divides it into four things that he observes happening. He looked at it and he saw, oh, look, they're coming up the same way. How much are they coming up the same way? They're rising. They're not there. They're arising. They are there, okay, and they pass away. Four little pieces he was noticing in the Anupada Sutta in 111. So it's enough to be able to do that and to understand that you're just in the present time. And to understand the key to um, getting to the right place with it, you know, comes down to Anicca, doesn't it? If you, if you understand Anicca, you can't get to where we want you to get, where you and I are talking about, unless you accept Anicca is always constantly functioning. So if it is, what are you worried about? If you don't like where you are, take a breath. In 10 minutes, everything's going to change. I mean, that's what I said that time I told you uh, there were 35 people in the house and I had to give a presentation and they told us when we went in the door, she said, when you give the presentation, remember, this is the teenager's night and they get to uh, ask the questions first. And the daughter was sitting, I didn't know, but the daughter was sitting next to the mother and she started to really complain about her mother. And she said, I have a problem with my mother. That's how it starts. And she says, you know, when I need to go shopping with my friends, I need to go shopping with my friends. And my mother comes in and says, grandma's coming over for tea at two o'clock. And um, she's asking me, don't go and get in the car with my friends. She's saying, could you clean your room and help me clean up here before you go? So everything's ready for grandma, you know, and, and, and she doesn't want to do what I want to do. And I don't like it when she tells me what to do. And so I, I'm listening to this and there's a whole room of people and she's just going on about how she doesn't like this and she doesn't like that. And I finally said, okay, stop. And she said, what? I said, stop then. Stop what? I said, just stop and take a breath because 10 minutes later, everything's going to change. So why don't you just help your mom for five minutes and just go get in the car and leave? <laughs> And she finally got it. It took her a split second to think what I said. But the point was, we all talk about Anicca. Everybody says Anicca Dukkha Anatta, Anicca Dukkha Anatta. And nobody takes the, fine, the time to figure out how to play with Anicca. It's functioning all the time, everywhere. If you don't like it that you lost your pen, well, then wait five minutes. You'll find another one. <laughs> you know? You know? If, if your car is stuck, well, wait a few minutes. It, it'll, it'll start if you stop pumping on the gas and pause for a minute. Maybe it won't be flooded and it'll start. <laughs> you see, it's, it's there all the time. In this case, um, she wanted to control everything. And it was like, take a breath, step back and relax and let Anicca go to work and everything will change. And you won't be facing that anymore. It took another story about Bada Rakata Sutta. We had to do that too to get it all the way across, you know. But once you get Anicca, this is an example where we were reading a minute ago, Anicca is looked at the changes causing the suffering. But is it? No. Atis causing it. Atis not cause, is, is causing it. See? The change is innocent. Change is part of the flow of life. You know, it's going to rain tomorrow. <laughs> it's going to rain. If you don't like the rain, well, then read a good book. <laughs> and pretty soon it'll stop raining. 
I told myself that during the monsoon last year, and sometimes it seemed like it was never going to stop. It was, you know, it was going on for two, three days in a row and floods were happening like only a couple of miles from here. But um, it's everything changes. So what do you think? Yeah. Is waiting for change. Uh, well, waiting for change can seem like inaction. Um, so, you know, in, in Europe at the moment, we're, we're seeing a lot of, uh, lot of problematic situations, in, in particularly uh, around Ukraine. Um, and, uh, you know, when is waiting for change um, the only option that you have that's available? And, and when is something else appropriate? Well, sure, but what I'm saying is you can move on in your mind. Something else is certainly appropriate. And um, that's another misnomer of, you know, just hang out. I know you have to get more precise in that when you say it, but just hanging out when things are going crazy wrong, it doesn't mean don't do anything. You sit down, you figure things out, you think about options, you write letters. People don't understand that writing letters is so incredibly powerful, you know? And we learned this in the Vietnam War. Um, the letter writing campaigns really did affect things. But before the Vietnam War, people didn't, I don't think people really understood the power of writing letters. Because for Rhode Island, if you write a letter, it means 300 people think the same thing you thought for Rhode Island or Delaware, you know. But if you wrote one letter in Pennsylvania, it's like between 27 and 2,700 to 3,000 people think that. And politicians, the reality of their very nature is that they think about the constituency all the time. Those are the people who are gonna vote for them. It's just right there under their skin while they're thinking about or doing anything once they're in office. They're continually thinking about that. And so you, you pipe up and start having six people around a table and you start writing a letter and um, you, all six of you are writing that in. For each one of you, it's 3,000 people that are writing that letter. Think about that. When you're talking California, it's ridiculously high numbers. Seven, eight thousand, um, fifteen thousand in one state. I think it's Texas. So the power of this is just remarkable. At the same time that you're thinking about this, there's another thing to take into consideration. If you're going to do absolutely nothing, you have to deal with the thing called stress in children living in the nuclear age. That was a subject that I worked with when my son was very young, and he got sick from that. And um, our, our pediatricians were not prepared for what was going on at that time. They were not ready for it. They didn't know what to tell parents. I just about wanted to, mm, to my pediatrician because I told him he's not sleeping at night. He's not eating. He's watching the news. And this is just the news reports on the TV. This wasn't the computer. Think about how bad it is now. You know, and um, with COVID, they faced a lot of increase. You don't hear much about this. A lot of increase in teenage suicides, a lot from 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds. That was a big tragedy. Nobody's looking at those statistics. Why? Because you took away the formative relationship years of these kids' lives in middle school and June, you know, they're what is it? Um, let's see, 18, 17, 18, 18, 18, up to 14, not senior high, but middle school, junior high and, and the junior high and, and yeah, the middle school and junior high is what it was. And I saw the statistics for that once and I was totally shocked and nobody's talking about it at all, not at all. And in 1975, uh, let's see, 1985, uh, the books were written, the results of 10 years of research on what was caused in the lives of children uh, who were living in the nuclear age. 
meaning the period of time when we were putting missile sites into the cornfields across the northern United States. And in 1975, uh, there were two young doctors who were doing simple exams for children. And um, one of the questions in the developmental, the questions you go to your pediatrician with your kids growing up, one of the questions is, what do you want to be when you grow up? That's what started all this research, the 10-year research block, okay? And um, they noticed there was an answer. And when they wrote the answer on the little page, they picked up on it. Instead of saying, when I grow up, I want to be, they put, if I grow up, I want to be. If, instead of when I grow up. That was the effect, the impact of putting all those missile silos across the Northern United States and aiming them at Russia. That's what it was, okay? And then at the end of 10 years, they produced four books which have disappeared into obscurity. Who knows where those books are now? And now we're in a new generation of developing nuclear weapons that are different. And so the SALT treaties canceled and does, it's not renewed because it didn't match fit right or something. So it didn't get renewed. And um, we're in a whole new generation. We, we, do, we shoot little ones now instead of big ones. <laughs> and then we think that that's not going to end up poisoning the earth, but we won't go there. But anyway, what my point is, um, the problem is still here now with what's been going on in the last 10 years. It is still here. And there is a great silence about this. And the books have disappeared from the 10 years of research. And my grandchildren are facing exactly what my child was facing, his father was facing, when he was a little kid at four or five years old going to the pediatrician. It's happening all over again. You see? So everything doesn't disappear, but this is what caused letter writing in our house. This is what caused the letter writing to start. Uh, because the pediatrician basically said, well, in I think it was in Russia, the, the child was told, um, when the bomb goes off, the little boy asked, little child asked the question, mommy, when the bomb goes off, do the rabbits die? That was the question. And my pediatrician said, just tell him the truth. And I said, and what is that, Dr. Milanovic? <laughs> if you're still out there, <laughs> probably not, but you know, um, he just looked me in the eye and he said, just tell them the truth. Everything turns into a cinder and that's the end of it. And I said, there is no way I'm going to tell him that. He's extremely sensitive. And we knew about the rabbit story already, but for him, it would have been the crawdad in the stream and it would have been the turtles and it would have been all kinds of little things that he likes to get involved in and the snake where it lives and this lizard and that lizard. He would have been tons of questions. And that's when I went to Washington the first time. And there were families who had gotten together with the question and the exact problem, you're causing stress in children living in the nuclear age. Why are you doing this to us? It's like a form of imprisonment for the parents because they don't know what to do. And the silence is deafening because the silence leaves the children in a position of dreaming up what it could mean, you see? And that's the danger of that whole thing. But nobody seems to be waking it up again. I don't hear anything about it even existing anymore, except it is existing. And the, 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 the things that happened because of COVID and because of, certainly because of the Ukraine and everything, you have a problem of a, a challenge here that isn't really being examined. Coming back to Buddhism, <laughs> the text, coming back here um, with 
the anxiety and everything that happens with this sort of thing can be helped by understanding how we get to the suffering of this kind of thing. And by staying in the present time is a good place to stay, but not to be, treat everything with revulsion, with repulsing it away. It's too strong of a word. It is definitely too strong of a word. You see, balance is what we need and to find out exactly clearly what is uh, happening, clearly what is going on in a situation and then looking at it as a challenge and considering are we behaving from the past, repeating ourselves, just re reacting constantly? Or are we looking, you know, too much in the future of what might happen that's keeping us from looking at just this part here, just this part? I don't see why we can't look at maybe one year trial periods of this or that new ideas. I don't know, I, I would like to be a fly on the wall, I guess, at these peace conferences that they have. And to try to understand what it is that's actually keeping us from trying new solutions, you know? So this section I was talking about with um, Sariputta, he says, he understood thus, so indeed these states not having been come into being and then having been, they vanish. That's the statement with the four pieces. You can see it in Majima um, Nikai number 111, section four, and it's down near the bottom of the paragraph. Not having been, yeah they arise and having been, yeah, not having been, they come into being. So one is not having been, come into being is two, having been, they've gotten over it. And the fourth one is they vanish, they just fall away because something else is happening. And so it keeps repeating that way, okay? Do you have anything else, anybody? Sarma was on a good track there. Um, the Zen and the Mahayana don't go very often into dependent origination as much as the texts actually go through it. You're right. Um, they do use it, but they don't go as far to examine it in the same way as the Buddha did. Anybody else? Hmm? Okay, uh, tomorrow uh, I start traveling. <laughs> tomorrow. Okay, so I'll be going to Poland. That's set up now in Gdansk. So for those who wonder where it ended up, it did end up in Gdansk. And there's a setup there. And we'll work there as a home base. We also have reservations in a uh, retreat center that is not far away from that where we will run the retreats. So it'd be back and forth, the two locations in between retreats, we'll be back in the base camp. And there's a lot of space in that place too. I was kidding around with somebody the other day. I said, you know, push come to shove, you can put a, put a tent on the roof. We have a big roof on top of this place that is, that is part of this unit. And then they have, it has a deck on one side, a deck on the other side. So there's a lot of space in this uh, and there's, uh, I think there's three bedrooms involved and, and it's all really set up nicely, set up really nicely. So we have people coming from four or five different countries and um, everybody seems to be getting very interested in it. 
Then I have people asking about the retreat at the end. We don't know what, what the dates for the retreat will be at the end, but as soon as I do know, we will let people know that it can be registered for, uh, for anybody who wants to come to that one, okay? And uh, any questions you have about the, uh, the topic we use today or you have suggestions of things you really want to know about, please write me and let me know because I like to dig for you and I'm happy to do that. And so that's really the methodology of training Sister Kama <laughs> was from the very beginning. Yeah, May. Uh, Sister Kema, I, I just out of curiosity, is there a way to uh, find out which of the suttas were in the early part, uh, sorry, the um, in terms of the Buddha's teaching career, which were, you know, uh, which were the suttas he delivered in the early part of his teaching career and which were the ones that um, he gave maybe towards a middle part or towards the end? Mm. Well, he taught for 45 years. And so, let's see how we would do that. I should probably, I can go to Yoshna and ask her, she's real good on the history. Paul Harvey's book, I, I think I put it here, wait a minute. I don't know what I did with it. Paul Harvey's book is the one that we used in the master's program for the history of Buddhism and it lays out it lays out the places you know the on the map like that sort of thing because they were walking and moving around like this you know and she might have a way and you know another thing you could research on this is um is it Nalanda I'm not sure if it's the word is Nalanda or Nanda it's a Malaysian group and and the one doctor, he, the one professor, he's really a good teacher. And he does the greatest presentation on the history of, of the Buddha and the text and stuff. And I'm not sure, I wanted to get his material and I don't think that I got it, but I can look into this for you. I can try to look into it. I will get there. I, I start to travel tomorrow is Monday. I fly on Tuesday morning real early. And then I've got to get over there and get rested. I have to line up some things that I have to do in, in Gdansk. Apparently I have to keep playing this game with the doctors. So I have to keep tracking this. <laughs> it's like, it's kind of like a treasure hunt, you know? <laughs> and trying to figure out what exactly is going on. So I have to continue the um, diagnostic procedure that I'm on this path of. And I stopped here and moved there and I, I can keep going there. We talked about it and it's not a problem. I can keep going there, but I have to keep going. You know, So we're setting up an office. I think we're setting up two offices and one is where I'll be working out of and the other one is where Pierre will be working out of. And um, so I should be able to get online and everything by the middle of the week, you know, but I think that's a good topic. We can try and find something on that. Yeah, let's try to do that for you. That's, it's a fun thing to try and do things. If you think of things like that, um, I don't know if I still have my notes, but I think I may have told you, I desperately wanted to know. Well, somebody came to me and pounded me about saying 84,000 suttas and 2,000 suttas by the Arahats and said, you say that a lot, is it true? And then I went, oh, it's interesting. I don't know. <laughs> and I just went on this journey of computing how many hours did he live through from the time he was enlightened, okay? until he passed away. And would it really be feasible for somebody to have done that many suttas? And it is feasible. <laughs> and when we figured it out, um, I had two different people helping me and we were doing it from different angles and trying to come up with tallies for different parts, like how long 
would you say, these are monks helping me? It was really fun. You know, how long did it take him to do his alms rounds every day? How much time do the guys spend going from where you are to a village? And how was it done? And how, you measure those hours and clean up time and cleaning up your uh, cootie or where you're sleeping. And, and then what are you gonna do for the day? And um, then you, you know, have to travel somewhere to, uh, to go for lunch. Sometimes you have to travel to, to a location. And it, it's usually those places were all near the city or near the town where they were going through. So it wasn't that, that hard that way. But they were like, sort of like a gypsy wagons, but they were walking. You see, they weren't riding. You know, I was I was traveling with somebody, and the uh, it was um, the water buffalo came behind us. It, that was in front of us, and we went around them. I said, he said to me, "Do you want to ride in the in the back of the wagon?" And I said, "I don't think I'm allowed to ride in the back of the wagon," but and I wasn't supposed to, so I didn't. Um, but they were traveling from one village to another with sugarcane and carrying it in the back of this wagon. And they had all this other stuff on top of it. And the family was sitting up there on top of it. It was just thinking about that's how slow this was all happening. So how long did it take them to do this and trying to compute it? Okay, the bottom line here was when we figured out the whole entire thing, we had 190,000 hours still left. And we wondered what did they do with them, you know, but some we said we miscalculated some way we miscalculated because of, we blamed it on Bikkhu Bodhi. It was all because of the ditto marks, <laughs> you know, it was all because of the ditto marks. Because I mean, you know, 148, uh, the Chichaka Sutta is on what? Four pages, right? It's on four pages, I think, right? Yeah, and when you take away the ditto marks and you fill the whole thing out, at 12 point font, it comes out to 26 pages. See? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so okay. trying to figure out, you know, and we're doing it in English, so I'm not sure. Sometimes it's a little longer if you do it in Bali. Yeah. Yeah, Sister Kima, just to explain a bit my curiosity there, because I was... Um, reflecting on my uh, own uh, method of teaching uh, music, as you know, and um, how I started a couple of years ago as to now. So the um, knowledge that I'm teaching has not changed, but the way that I'm uh, conveying it to the students has. So I'm kind of curious um, if the Buddha had that as well in his entire 45 year teaching career. And um, a small note was, uh, when, yeah, I'm not sure. I, it's just a question. Well, yeah, like a good example of that. Okay, there's one example about it. You know, traditionally, he taught the four elements. So, you know, he taught the traditional way in the beginning. He was only teaching four elements. He wasn't teaching six in the beginning. Then it got to five. And then it finally, the, the last one came in, uh, this consciousness, I think it was or something. And um, yeah, I thought that was interesting because in the beginning, the sutras, he, uh, I think Bhikkhu Bodhi said something about that. And, you know, he has that training program for the Majima Nikaya. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, it consists of about a set of CDs. They're CDs, you know, that, that's what they were on. I, I don't think they were even DVDs at that point. But he has those, and I had that program. I had a lot of that stuff at the center, never got over here with me. <laughs> you know, it just never caught up with me. Um, but that program is pretty cool because uh, he tells a lot about the individual people in that program that he taught. And um, I think you can still get that online at Amazon. I'm not sure, but I think you can. And for instance, just as an example, um, the pot, the story of the potter shed, is it 140, I think it is, or something. Uh, who was in there that he was wanting to share the, who was that guy? The whole story 
and Bhikkhu Bodhi pauses and he tells the whole story. And I thought it was so neat. I'll never forget it uh, because this guy actually, and that, you know, it must have really tipped people off in that time too, because he was a, he was a, a prince and his father uh, had him doing a lot of things running the kingdom. And his father got sick and he died. And when his father got sick and he died, he turned it over to the to the chancellor, you know, to take care of it. And um, he said, no, just distribute the wealth to the to the people. And <laughs> these people probably were really upset, you know, what happened. And then uh, he said, I've decided to what happened was that. Um, let's see. Uh, King Pasanati uh, and him, they had been communicating with each other okay and uh he wanted to send him a gift after they met somehow then they went back to their kingdoms and he wanted to send him a gift and so he had a series of plates with some sutras on it made out metal plates and had it taken up and given to him as gift and then what he did in return was interesting because he gave um it's it's like lamb's wool. I can't remember what you call it. It's very, very expensive. Cashmere, real cashmere. Very, very light, uh, this wool. And um, he made a whole bunch of that and he sent, had it delivered to him in the South. They would use it in the South, like if it was a wind came up or if you were living by the sea in the evening as a shawl and stuff like that, they would. It's so... Um, so he, he got to know the suttas and he read them and everything. And that's what made him leave. And he just picked up the life as a mendicant, as a, a monk and declared the Buddha to be his teacher and came, was walking to the South to find the Buddha is where he was going. He was hunting for him to try to get to where he was. And when the Buddha saw in his mind this man is ready to become an arahat and I should teach him now because of what is happening to him next. And then what happens is he dives in the earth and comes up nearby and walks in, knocks, you know, asks the man if he could stay in the powder shed. And the other guy's in there. And he says, well, if he doesn't mind it, it's okay with me if you go in and sit with him. He goes in there and then it gets very interesting because you want to know precisely what did he teach him in one night? He taught him the whole teaching. That's why that's a very important sutta. And he, he gave it to him in a way that he had to repeat it and learn it. And he learned it very, very well. And then of course, at the end of that sutta, we're always, I always end up crying. <laughs> I always, we always feel so bad because here he is and he doesn't even know it's the Buddha teaching him. And then he's really embarrassed because he called him friend and the Buddha forgives him and says, well, if you are a monk and I will ordain you, all, but do you have a robe and bowl? And he says, I don't, I have to go and get it. I have to go and get one. And so he leaves the powder shed to go and get it. And the next thing we know, uh, he's, he's been killed by a stray cow, killed him. That's all it says, it just says a stray cow killed him. While he was going out to get the bowl and the robes to come back to have the Buddha at, you know, ordain him um, and go with the Buddha. And then a stray cow killed him. And then he tells the monks, yes, but he got to be an anagami. He was an anagami. And it was so completed. So it's a precious sutta because you want to you wanna see very specifically um, what did he teach him in one night. So it's compact, you know, and it, it gave me the idea right away that we can say why are Bhante's uh, retreats why are people progressing so smoothly? And then gradually I figured out, you know, it's because he's not teaching you just the meditation. He's teaching you the Dhamma as a parallel teaching with the meditation. Then we backed up and I would talk to him some more and gradually decipher what specifically was the precise 
stuff and is it hooked together? And it turns out that there are eight or 10 pieces, depending on how you look at it, and they're hooked together, woven together. And if you get them in your head, woven together, you can practice very smoothly and very progressively. And that's why it was happening, see? So all this is interesting, it really is. But I will try to find out for you, um, basically, um, Tell me the question you, the way you would frame it. Um, so which part, so which, which suttas were um, delivered by the Buddha during the early part of his teaching career? Um, which ones were in the, the, the middle part of his teaching career? And then towards the end, um, as he gets older, um, so, yeah, we can pin down some of them, you know, remember the one where he sits down and um, he's going to give the sutta and he says, Ananda, please give the sutta. My back is hurting me. I need to lie down and shift my position. So we know that he was in his 80s when he did that. See, that's when that was happening, when the, the, the uh, stuff was coming back on him from the karma from before about his back. And we know that he taught um, that, not, that uh, Rahula was growing up with him. And so we have four suttas from Rahula. And the first one is when he's only seven or eight years old when he first got there. And there's, we always pull out three of them distinctly. The one is when he first came. Then there's one when he was um, 15, I think, or 16 years old. And then there's one that happens just before he leaves to teach in another place. And so that's happening while he's growing up. Okay. And so we have the ages for that. Like he's, I think he's like five years, no, seven years old or eight, eight years old in the first one. And then 17 years old on the next one. And then the next one, I think is like 21 or something. Yeah. Something like that. We have the ages for those suttas. But I don't know, but I seem, I kind of remember that Paul, he had that in um, his book, the one that I keep around here for the history. And we use that one and I, uh, Peter Harvey, I think it is or something. It's worth getting, it really is worth getting it at the, in Amazon, just a second. Um, I think I know where it is. No, it's not here. That's creepy. I'm not sure what I did with it. But I did have it. I may have. Yeah, I may have given it to somebody, given it to one of the teachers, and then thought I was going to buy it again or something. <laughs> I must have done that. But it's worth it's worth trying to see. And the place I'm thinking of, I want to say. It's it's Professor Tan, T A N, and this the group is it's Nalanda. I, I want to say it's Nalanda, the same name as the university was. It's Nalanda, and it's located in um, Kuala Lumpur, outside of Kuala Lumpur. And if you put Nalanda in, you probably would come up with it. I'll try to see in a minute when we when we shut down. I'll look and send it to you. Okay. We will check that out and see. Anybody else have any ideas? Please shoot them over to me or tell May and she'll put them on a note. And um, yeah, Bhante Damagavesi, uh, he finished his retreat and it went really, really well. And he ended up having 20 people for the whole thing, which was not expected. And then he's, he's on his way flying over to the next place. And um, he's going to be doing that one shortly. So we're on the move, okay? All right, let's do our prayer. Mm -hmm. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired 
for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. See you guys next week. I hopefully I will see you next week. We'll just have to see what happens, but <laughs> one step at a time now, okay? <laughs> okay, everybody. Bye bye. I'm playing with this and I'm supposed to be doing this instead. Okay.